good singing. Amen. You can be seated. We're going to take our Bibles tonight and we're going to be over in um, 3 John. 3 John. While you're turning, let me just mention a couple of prayer requests on top of our list tonight. Um, Brother Bernard, don't forget to let remind me at the end of the message in case I forget to have altar of prayer at the end of the service. Can you remember to do that for me, please, in case it slips my mind? And that happens a lot here lately. But Sister Emily's grandmother, Sister Debbie Young's mom, Edna Young, is in the Bayview Hospital. I praise the Lord she's improving. We thank the Lord for that. Uh, but let's remember her in prayer. And then Brother Will Wren, one of our dear uh, senior saints, is experiencing a lot of physical problems. And he's on the top of our list tonight. So let's remember him. Uh, I was so blessed on uh, Sunday night. Of course, we had an amazing Sunday. Wasn't that awesome, Brother Joel Haynes? Brother Joel Haynes was here. And uh, the Lord just worked it out for that dear man of God to preach. And my goodness, what a message. And... Um, by the way, um, they came over to the house after church Sunday night, and we just fellowshiped and preached to one another, and man, we just wore each other out. We had a time. Um, a kindred spirit, without a doubt, loves God. It was just a fireball. And uh, anyway, so you'll be, you'll be tickled, I hope, I think, to know that I was able to book him for missions conference in March. He will be our main preacher in our missions conference in March. Amen. I am excited about that. He's a second generation missionary. Of course, y'all got to hear him Sunday morning. Uh, definitely knows how to deliver and handle the Word of God. Uh, it stirred my heart. I tell you, I sit over there, just my heart was burning uh, through that message on Rahab the harlot out of Hebrews 11. What an amazing message. And so he'll be coming back and preaching for us in March. I do have those dates I'm supposed to have on top of my head. And everybody else that knows it beside me just walked out of here for principles of growth. I'll get them to you. It's the first week in March. First week in March. It's a Wednesday night through that Sunday. First through the what, fifth? Is that it? I think that's it. You want to mark that down in your calendar, all right? You don't want to miss that. And then also, Brother Haynes has invited our church to come back out there. Let's try this again in August of next year for that Navajo Nation's missions trip. And they have a conference where all of the churches that they've started, uh, they all come together for a big old kind of a camp meeting. And uh, he asked me if I'd preach every night and uh, bring a group with me out there to go out and do canvassing during the day. And uh, so we tried to do that, uh, was that 2020? Is that when I, was that what, 2020 or 2021? It was last year, wasn't it? It was last year. And right at the last minute, everybody out there got sick. I mean, all of them got it. And so we had to call it off at the last minute. We had the vans rented. We had the motel rooms rented. We had the literature printed and shipped. They was, it was there. And it just all, it was just, we have to just believe that all things work together for good. Uh, but he wants us to come out there in August. So that's next year. That's not this August, all right? That's 2023. I'm glad I remember to clarify that. So if you'd like to go, uh, well, that'll be uh, some time off. Uh, but we'd like to take a good group out. And be a part of that. So, amen. And then Sunday night. Wasn't Sunday night awesome? Brother Nathan's ordination service. Just a tremendous service. And a sweet move of God. I almost forgot what I was going to say uh, when I started telling all this. So, after church Sunday night, little Gracie Wiley came up to me. She said, we didn't take on our two missionaries tonight. And I said to myself, how awesome is it when the little kids are so excited about the missions that they're bummed out and we don't take on two on a Sunday. How awesome is that? And so uh, we'll definitely do that next week. We just had so much going on Sunday uh, with all that. But we definitely, Brother Leader, has been working hard vetting new missionaries. And uh, we are so excited. He met a missionary in Africa that's been there since 1989. 89. And they have started. He's trained preachers. And they've started, if I, not, if I, don't, if I remember correctly, I think he said 50 all over several neighboring countries, several of them that we're not in, Brother Bittner. And so we had, that was awesome. You told me hitting the jackpot when you're trying to find good missionaries and you find out you got one that started churches in about three or four different countries with all their trained preacher boys. So God's doing amazing things. 
with our faith promise. And I am excited about you giving and encourage you to continue to give. All right, 3 John, did you find it? It's a big book. It's a big book. It's got 14 verses in it. Uh, I, won't, I won't keep you long tonight. I do have a thought that I want to give you. I actually I had several different thoughts, but I kind of narrowed it down to this one tonight because I love this verse in 3 John. Uh, if you want to, would you stand with me, please? We're just going to read, uh, uh, for the sake of time, we're just going to read half the chapter. How's that? We're going to read half the book. That's what we're going to do. We're going to read half the book. The elder unto the well-beloved well Gaius, whom I love in the truth, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy, verse 4, than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, uh, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and the strangers which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such, that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. I'm going to stop right there. We're going to focus on this man named Gaius for a little bit. And I want to preach on this thought out of verse 4. No greater joy. No greater joy. Lord, help us tonight as we turn our hearts and our minds to the Scriptures. We thank you, Lord, for the singing. Thank you, Lord, for the young people, the children that was able to get up tonight and sing the songs. And, Lord, what really blessed my heart was the amount of effort that went into the Bible memorization, the Scripture memorization. We thank you, Lord, for our children's ministry workers and the time and, and the energy and the sacrifice that they make. Lord, to teach and train our young people in the ways of God. What a blessing tonight to hear them in that little program. We pray that you bless now the preaching of the Word, and I pray that you would encourage our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can be seated. There are three characters in this uh, short book. Uh, maybe one of these days we'll dive into these other ones in a little bit deeper way. But tonight I want to focus on just the first one, a man by the name of Gaius. And uh, the, the, while we're thinking about uh, the statement in verse number four, I have no greater joy, have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And I begin to think about how many things there are in the life of a Christian that brings us joy. I started to make a long list and I stopped after three because I had several supporting verses that I wanted to turn to. And I said, I'm just going to give three tonight but by way of introduction of some things that bring a child of God joy. I was looking at Acts chapter number 15. Turn with me over there. Just put a, a ribbon or a piece of paper or something over in 3 John. Just keep your place there. But in Acts chapter number 15, of course, I was just doing a word study on, on the joy and rejoicing. And I, sometimes I get, I get distracted and I start reading all these verses and I get about 15 messages up working on one. That's how it works sometimes. That Bible is so alive. Uh, but I was looking at the words joy and joyous and rejoicing and, uh, and gladness and just thinking about uh, the things in a child of God's life that brings us joy. And I'm going to get to the message here in just a minute. But he said, I have no greater joy. All right, because there are joys. There's a lot of joys. I'm glad there's not just one or two, but there's several of them. But in Acts chapter number 15 and in verse um, number 3, the Bible says, And being uh, brought on their way by the church, they passed through uh, Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. If you're taking notes, write this down, number one, by way of introduction, the announcement of salvations will bring a child of God joy. That is some of the greatest news we can hear, is somebody getting saved. I love it here at Calvary Baptist Church, where we, uh, we have salvations almost almost on a weekly basis. I don't take that for granted. I've been places where they don't, if you don't see people get saved sometimes for weeks or months and they go through a drought and preachers will preach salvation messages. They'll give a gospel and, and nobody moves. Nobody, nobody raises their hand. Nobody gets saved. And boy, that's, that's, uh, that's discouraging. And, but here at Calvary Baptist Church, I'm grateful every time I get a text message or an email from Sister Hannah and Brother Caleb that somebody got saved, a child or two got saved, or one of our bus kids got saved in junior church. I always say amen. And then we had one saved Sunday morning. We had a lady raise her hand in the back that was in Sunday school and been coming a little 
little bit and she got, the Lord dealt with her and she raised her hand Sunday morning and got saved. And I tell you, that's good news. I like to hear that. That's some of the greatest news. In fact, I can't think of any news any greater than to hear of somebody getting born again, saved by the grace of God. In fact, the Bible says in Luke 15, verse number 10, there's joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repenteth. Amen. Presence in the joy of the angels. Now, uh, uh, joy in the presence of the angels. And I've wondered how that happens. How, how is it that in heaven they find out somebody got saved on earth? I don't know how that works. I know when I get to heaven, somebody asked me the day, so do you think people in heaven can look down and see what all of us are doing? I said, well, it wouldn't be heaven if they could. Who wants to watch this mess, huh? But I remember when Zane was born in the hospital and every time over that maternity or every time a baby was born, that there would be a little, there would be a little song or a little bell. Was it just, a, it was a little tune that was played and everybody knew in the whole hospital we knew that the baby was just born. I can't help but wonder maybe in heaven if God don't have just a couple of angels over there and their job is just play a little tune every time somebody gets saved. And every time somebody gets saved, the Bible says there is joy in the presence of the angels over one center, center that repenteth. And it doesn't say the angels are rejoicing. It says there's rejoicing and joy in the presence of the angels. I can't help but believe that Jesus don't just throw his hand up and say, hallelujah, somebody else just got saved. But I'm talking about the announcement of salvation ought to cause people to rejoice. And I'm grateful for that good news. I was reading in Acts chapter number eight. You're right there in Acts. Turn back to chapter number eight. Look at what it says over there in verse number five. The Bible says, I love to hear the rustling of the pages. Acts, uh, Acts 8, 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with him, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And there was great joy in that city. People were excited about what God was doing in the hearts and lives of people. We ought to get excited about salvation. You say, well, I really don't get all that excited when somebody gets saved. Well, then we know who did not invite them to church. You say, I don't really get that fired up when somebody gets saved. Well, then that's not somebody you've been praying for. That's not somebody you've been witnessing to on the job. That's not somebody you've been working on and begging to come to church because whenever you do that and they come and they get saved, I promise you, you'll get excited. Amen. The announcement of salvation is a source of great joy for the child of God. Number two, the association of the saints of God is a source of great joy. In so many places in the writings of the Apostle Paul, we see references to joy in connection with his love and his fellowship and his relationship with the people of God. 1 Thessalonians 2 and in verse number 18, he said, Wherefore, we would come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and our joy. Several times you see the word rejoicing and joy in connection with Paul's relationship and his association with the people of God. They were who he lived for. They were the people that he invested in. Those were the people that he preached to and prayed for and loved. In 2 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 4, Paul said, Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. If I could just see you, if I could just see your face, I'd be filled with joy. Anybody in here associate, relate to that joy that you feel when you see the people of God? You're out in the world all week. You're rubbing shoulders with all, all of the sin and all the filth and all the, all the nastiness and all the ungodliness and all the, all the blasphemy. And you come to church and you see that glow and you see that smile on the face of a brother or a sister. And boy, it just ought to just put a little extra spring in your step. Even before the service starts, just being with God's people ought to bring you joy. It does me. I come in here on Wednesday nights just like you. I'm dragging. I'm tired. Been a long day. And my body thinks it's time to find a shower and a recliner and a big old tall glass of lemonade. And I say, no, we're going to church. And my flesh says, I don't want to go to church. And then I come in here and I see you smiling and all of a sudden I get my second win and I'm grateful to be in the house of God with God's people. One reason why I love going to church so much because I love seeing y'all. I love seeing you. Philemon 1, 7. For we have a great joy 
and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. What about that? Being refreshed by the brethren, by the people of God. Philemon chapter one, verse number 20. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Boy, we could just go on and on and on and on. One of my favorite things about church, one of my favorite things about camp meetings and Bible conferences, one of my best, my, my favorite things about missions conference is all the people of God that you get to hang around with. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to them for church, go to church with them, and then hang out with them after church, and sometimes you get to go out and eat, and sit there at a the table, and enjoy food and fellowship, and they have to run us out of the restaurants many times because we're there way past closing time. What are we doing? We're just enjoying the fellowship with God's people. The greatest people on earth is the people of God. Amen. I'm glad to be a part of the people of God. The announcement of salvation is a source of great joy. The association of the saints. But thirdly, you're going to love this one. And that is the advent of suffering is a source of great joy. And I got just about as many amens as I was expecting on that one right there. As I began to look up how many Bible verses talked about joy, I couldn't believe how many of them talked about suffering and persecution and affliction as a child of God being a source of great joy. Some of y'all looking at me like, are you serious right now? Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 5. Listen closely. In Matthew 5 verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you. I don't like to be reviled, do you? It bothers me. Gets under my skin, which means I'm probably not very spiritual. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. That's what Jesus said. You say, well, that's, that's, uh, that's Jesus. He's, he's God in the flesh. He can do anything. I knew he was going to say that. James, who was not God in the flesh, in chapter 1, verse 2, said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Are we having fun yet? How many ever sitting there going, man, I hope tomorrow my source of joy is the advent of sufferings. I hope that God just lets it, he just pours it out on me tomorrow so I can jump up and down and rejoice and have a wonderful day. How many of you? I didn't think so. Acts 13, verse 50. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts but they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came into Iconium and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. What about that? Persecution? They got run out of the country. They got expelled. And they got to shouting and rejoicing. <laughs> oh my goodness. I I can't, I can't pick on you too much. I was looking like you was looking when I was looking these verses up. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. And that's only a couple of them. There are so many verses in the Bible that clearly associates suffering, affliction, and persecution with joy. <laughs> Acts 5, verse number 40. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them. Anybody get beaten lately for being a Christian? Anybody? Anybody get brought before the magistrates? Anybody get hauled in before the courts and get beaten for being a, a child of God, a believer? When they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. <laughs> what amazing testimony. I'm going to have to be honest with you. These guys are more spiritual than I am. I'm going to be honest with you. First thing I probably would have done was head to the pharmacist and got some salve and got some pain medicine. And I went home and said, all right, Grace, put that on my back right there. And while you're at it, I need you to shoot out a group text and ask everybody to pray for me. That's what I'd have done. 
Huh? I think that's what we all would have done. And we went home and contemplated whether or not we were serious about this thing. They walked out of there rejoicing because they had the opportunity to suffer for the sake of Christ. Well, that went over like a lead balloon. Am I still in the book? Here's what he said. Let's get back over to 3 John. Let's get back over to 3 John. Here's what he said in verse number four. I have no greater joy of all the things in my life and all the things in the ministry, of all the things that I have experienced serving the Lord, there is a thing that brings me ultimate joy, no greater joy. Well, I got to look at this passage of scripture right here and I broke it down and I'm gonna give you three things that we find just in Verse number four, and I'm going to have to say amen to what John said here. These things also bring me great joy. They'll bring, they bring you great joy as well if they apply to you. Let's look at them quickly. Number one, there's no greater joy than a training that is effectual. John, the older saint, has apparently at some point invested in the life of Gaius. Now he calls him my children in verse number four. He's obviously in verse number one, the elder unto the well-beloved Gaius. So he's, he's, the, he's the senior saint, all right? He's, the, he's the, uh, the father figure, if you will. Now, in the scriptures, uh, the, 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 the Bible is clear. When you lead people to Christ, they are your children in the faith. Right. Apostle Paul referred to Timothy several times as my son, in the faith. He wasn't his physical son. He wasn't his natural born son, but he was his son in the faith. Meaning that at somehow or another, the apostle Paul had influenced Timothy to be saved. And that was his, that was his child. I, one of the things that, that has stirred my heart here at Calvary Baptist Church since uh, uh, about the, well, whenever we did the principles of growth, I can't remember which year it was. It's all kind of running together. Um, can anybody remember when we started Principles of Growth? Was it last year? Year before last? 2021. All right, thank you. So I had written a discipleship book when I was a missionary in South Africa, but it was written on a completely different level. I mean, I had to just dissect things and really be super, super simple and, and, and explain Little things like prayer. Who do we pray to? Because over there they prayed to dead ancestors. They prayed to dead ancestors and, and uh, things of that nature. So, I mean, when I, I, you couldn't just tell people to pray. You had to tell them who to pray to and who not to pray to and all that kind of stuff. And so my, my discipleship book, it had about 34 lessons in it. Uh, and and, and well, brother, brother Roth was on me. Uh, him and his wife are, are out of town, by the way. Uh, so that's why they're not here tonight or they'd be here. But that brother Roth said, preacher, you got to get that discipleship book. And I said, I know, I know, I know. He said, you got to get that discipleship book. Boy, he stayed on me about that discipleship book. And every time he said something, I said to myself, I'm going to go do that book. And then I'd get distracted and I wouldn't. And I got to realize that we had people getting saved. They needed to be trained. and needed to be taught. Why? Because they're our children in the faith. Amen. Amen. He talks about getting saved in John 3 as a type of a picture of the new birth. You must be born again. So when you lead somebody to Christ, they're babes in Christ. As newborn babes, Peter said, that desire the sincere milk of the word. So here we are leading people to the Lord. People getting saved, they're getting baptized, joining the church, and now they need to be trained. Why? Because they're our children. Let me just make an application here, all right? The context here, he's talking about an older saint of God, talking to a younger saint of God. But let me just throw this in there for you mamas and daddies that's got youngins. Train them. Train them. People can train whales and dolphins and horses and monkeys. They can train just about everything. But for some reason or another, people ain't figured out how to train youngins. They figured out how to train human beings. Come on, it can be done. You say, well, I tried. You tried about three minutes and then you got a text message and forgot what you were doing. Yeah. Kids can be trained. Here's what the Bible says, are you ready? Don't you just love it when I say something really strong and then I say, and the Bible says, and I back it up with the Bible verse, train up a child, train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Train him up. Teach him how to mind, teach him how to sit down. 
when you say sit down. Teach them how to stand up when you say stand up. Teach them to stop when you say stop. Teach them to be quiet when you say be quiet. Teach them to go to bed when you say go to bed. Amen. Well, that can't be done. She don't tell my wife. She done done it five times. Don't tell her. It can be done. Landon, Landon's one. Just turn one. He knows what no means. Knows what no means. Walking around at the house, he's at grandpa's house. He's at grandpa's house. Reach over there to grab that little figurine. I go, no. He pulls his hand back and he just, he just waddles right on off in his little diaper. <laughs> his little diaper just waddles right on across the room. I said, that's a good boy. That's a good boy. Good boy, Landon. No. No. Mom and daddy's been training baby Landon. Amen. Oh, that went over like a lead balloon too. <laughs> Training that is effectual. There's no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. We trained them. We invested in them. We poured ourselves into them. And what do you know? It worked. No greater joy than a training that is effectual. Paul said it like this in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. When Paul was over at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13 and 14, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye brethren became followers of the churches of God which are in Judea uh, that are in Christ Jesus. He says we preached, we opened up the scriptures, we taught, we trained, we preached, we discipled, and it took... It worked. That will bring joy. That will bring joy. This discipleship ministry, this principles of growth that we've started here at Calvary Baptist Church has been something that's been on my heart for a long time. And we've got right now 14, 15, 16 back there right now, one-on-one, one-on-one being discipled. Going through the Word of God, they're looking up Scripture verses, writing down Scripture verses, filling in the blanks and understanding, learning major truths and concepts and principles of the Word of God. Can I tell you who's having just as much fun as the ones learning? The ones teaching. When you go home and you've gotten that book out and you're the teacher and you've studied that lesson, gone over that lesson, reviewed that lesson, and then you sit down with a new convert or you sit down with a new member or you sit down with somebody that's been saved longer than you've been alive and we've got some senior saints back there right now. Loving it. Loving it. You know who's having just as much fun as the students? The ones that are teaching them and when they're going through that lesson and they're going through that principle and looking those verses up, they look up and they see the light come on and they see the smile on their face. That teacher, that one that is investing and pouring into that student is excited because it's taken. It's a great day when the one you're teaching gets it. They understand it. There's no greater joy than a training that is effectual. Number two, there's no greater joy than a testimony that is evident. A testimony that is evident. We've got a lot of Secret Service Christians. Undercover. Incognito. Not Gaius. Look at verse three. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee. People were talking, Gaius. They were talking about your life. They were talking about your relationship with God. They were testifying about your testimony. Now think about that just a minute. He said in verse number four, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. It's one thing when you can see it for yourself, but that might be because you're there watching them. It's another thing when you're not there and it's still, the training still takes. Amen. You know what's a blessing? When you drop your kids off at the babysitter and you say to them before you leave, now act like you got some sense. And we say that because if they do, it is an act. They are acting 100%. Act like you got some sense. And you leave to go on a date with your wife. The whole time you're gone, you think, man, I hope the kids are doing okay. I hope the kids are doing okay. You don't text and you don't call because you want plausible deniability. Yeah. You stay out late and enjoy being with your date 
and being with your wife, and then you go pick the kids up. And they come out the door and they don't have bandages and their arm's not in a sling or a cast. You think, well, that's a good sign. And you ask the babysitter, how were they? You just kind of wait for that answer. And if they go, well, you just pay them and run out. (laughs) How were they? Oh, they were great. And you say, really? Are you sure? They didn't give you no trouble? No, they were good. You mean they didn't? You mean, I said they were good. Wow. 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 And you kind of, you kind of start feeling kind of excited, kind of proud. Yeah. Yeah. That's my kids. What I expect. Of course they did good. When you hear, when you hear that when they wasn't with you, when they wasn't around you and you wasn't there watching them and you hear that they did what they were supposed to do. Well, I think, I think when a child of God has a testimony that is so genuine that other people are telling other people about your testimony, that's something to get excited about. No, a, a testimony that is evident. Look at what it says. In, he's not finished. Look at what it says in verse 5. Beloved, thou doest faithfully. Faithfully. This isn't just something you do on Sunday. This is not just something you do when you're around certain people. And you've got to meet certain criteria. This is a faithful testimony. Thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. People that you don't know. People that don't know you. People that don't know where you go to church. They don't know who your family is. They don't know who your pastor is. You can just you could easily just kind of assimilate. Camouflage. Just kind of slide in there under the radar and just kind of blend in and get away and nobody know who you are, that you're saved or that you say you're saved. And you could easily, when you're in that environment, just let your guard down and kind of let that old man take over. Come on now. Just to kind of take some of the pressure off of you. I know nobody in here would do that when they're around a bunch of lost people is just let nobody know you're saved to kind of lower everybody's expectation of you, but not Gaius. Gaius lived such a way, not just before the church. Am I still in the book? Which have borne witness of thy charity before the church. In verse number five, he talked about he did it to the brethren and the strangers. A testimony that's evident. And a testimony that is evident both to the church and to strangers. That's pretty consistent. That's consistent. When you're around a bunch of lost people, people that don't know you, don't know where you're from, they ought to recognize there's something different about you. Right. Amen. Yeah. I've had people ask me before I could tell them, are you a preacher? Are you a preacher? And I've been in Home Depot. Are you a preacher? What made you ask that? Well, he's looking at the price of that plywood, and you said, God, help us. And I just thought maybe you was a preacher. <laughs> Lord, help us. Are you a preacher? Yeah. Wax eloquent in the aisle at Home Depot, $75 for a sheet of plywood. Lord, help us. I'm joking. Now, your testimony ought to be so evident. That's something to get excited about. Number three, write this down. No greater joy than a truth that is embraced. The word truth is used in this conversation about Gaius one, two, three, four, five times. It starts in verse number one. The elder under the well-beloved Gaius whom I love in the truth. It's almost as if the truth was almost the premise. It was almost like the common ground, the common denominator that triggered this love between John and Gaius is that they both had the same love and passion for the truth. I like being around people that love the truth, don't you? I'm attracted to people. I'm drawn to people that's passionate about the truth. Sitting at the table at the house on Sunday night with Brother Joel Haynes and his wife, and their kids were downstairs. They've got, how I many, six boys? Five. Sounded like 15 of them down there. <laughs> they was down there with Zane having a Nerf gun war. Oh, my goodness. Nerf gun. He's got every kind of Nerf gun there is. They was, they was shooting. A couple of little kids just hung out in the stairwell because that was the safe space. 
They were having a time down there. And we were sitting at the table, fellowship, and talking about the ministry, talking about the work of God, telling our testimonies, talking about discipleship, talking about church planning, and just talking shop is what we were doing. And boy, you don't have to hang around Brother Joel Haynes long to find out that man loves God and he loves the ministry. A second generation missionary that's not bitter. A second generation missionary's kid that's not a recovering fundamentalist. Imagine that. A second generation missionary that grew up in the deserts of Arizona and New Mexico while his daddy was trying to start churches, they were just homeschooling and playing out in the middle of the desert with little Indian kids. And that's how he grew up. Boy, there's been a lot of people would have just said, the, the day, the minute I can get out of here and get back to civilization. He said to me, he said, he said we were sitting at the table. He said, you said, you got how many people in this area? I said, there is 400,000 people in a seven mile radius of this church. You go up that hallway and look at that map right there. Seven mile radius of this church is at least 400,000 people. He said, we ain't got that many people in the whole reservation and it's the size of the state of West Virginia. Said, Man, you just got acres and acres and miles and miles of nothing. Little pockets of people, little settlements, little communities. Here and there, we gotta go find them. We gotta go win them. And then we're talking about the ministry and the work of God and he said how that God called him to go back Went back, got married, went back. Went back to that place that he grew up in that was so desolate and dry where he didn't have a lot of friends. Nothing to do. And what do you do in the middle of the desert? Watch scorpions fight and watch cactus grow? What do you do? Nothing to do. Went back, loves it. He's got a strategy, he's got a vision, he's got a plan to put churches all over that reservation. He said, we're hitting it hard as we can. And he said, you know what one of the most awesome things is right now? My daddy started that little Bible college. He said, and everybody that came in there had been a drunk, had been a, had been a gambler, got saved. He said, now, now their kids are coming to Bible college. He said, and for the first time, we've got a whole crop of Bible college students that ain't drunks. And he said, God is starting to, the, the exponential growth and the momentum that they're starting to see. And boy, he was so excited. And you all know, we were, I was excited talking about our church, talking about our faith promise mission, talking about the Every Nation Project. And he was talking about the, the Navajo Nation. You all know what the common denominator was? Love and a passion for truth. Amen. I got looking at the statement that really jumped off the page at me in verse number three. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth, watch this, that is in thee. It was in him. Yeah. And Brother Bernard, this is what hit me. It was in him because when John and everybody else poured it into him, it didn't leak out. <laughs> the truth was in him because he didn't pour it out. And boy, we've seen people do that, haven't we? You pour truth into them. I mean, you just pour a whole bunch of truth into them and they walk outside, get in the car and at the first stop sign, they roll down the window and they pour it all out. I ain't listening to that. I ain't doing that. I don't believe that. That's just what he thinks. You know why the truth was in him? Because he didn't pour it out. Truth was in him because he didn't let it leak out. Truth was in him because he didn't replace it with lies and fables and deception. And you know what happens? You know what the product, you know what the result of the truth being in you is? You'll walk in the truth. That's what it says in verse three. The truth that is in thee. He goes on down in verse number eight. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. Working and laboring together to make sure the truth gets out. Make sure people hear the truth. Make sure people know the truth. The relationship John had with Gaius was centered around truth. That ought to be a common denominator with God's people. Truth. Love for truth. You say, well, ain't nobody else, nobody else is saying that. But if it's the truth, it's the truth. And I'm telling you right now, we've entered into some seriously dangerous territory in this country. With now we're fixing to have an office of misinformation run by some of the biggest liars that's ever been living on this planet. Misinformation. Misinformation. A former, a former news reporter said last night in an interview 
that people that spread misinformation ought to go to jail. And I just want to ask him, do you have any idea what the phrase freedom of speech means? You say, well, I just don't think people that tell, tell lies ought to be allowed to tell lies. Only problem is, who's the one that gets to decide if it's a lie or not? Right. Think about that just a minute. There's always been lies. There's always been deception, all the way back in the Garden of Eden. But when you're saved and you've got the Holy Spirit living within you, he will lead you and he will guide you into truth. You won't fall for that mess. We're living in a day and age where people are scared to say the truth. They're afraid if they say the truth, they're going to be ostracized. They're going to be cut off. They're going to be blackballed, blacklisted. Well, you might be, but you'll still be right. That's got to count for something. I'm thinking about saying something. I don't know if I ought to or not. I did a podcast last week about pedophiles in the pulpit. We got, we got registered sex offenders and child molesters. that are welcome in some places because of who they are. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to beat this drum till my arms fall off. A man that's got that in his past, in his background, a man that's got that in his life, I'm not saying he can't be forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. If he repents and he turns and he asks God for forgiveness, I believe the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse us from all sin. But I'm going to tell you something right now. I ain't got no use for somebody that put one of them jack legs behind a sacred desk Amen. to preach to their people. Amen. And it's gotten any more even saying that. You get attacked. You get ostracized. People think you don't believe in forgiveness. You don't believe in restoration. You don't believe in the grace of God. I do, but I also believe in biblical qualifications for leadership. Amen. You speak the truth. I wasn't even going to do a podcast. I had no intentions of doing a podcast on that. I got bigger fish to fry. But I was sitting at the airport, LAX, with my wife trying to catch a plane, come back home last week, and I just threw this thing out. I said, I said that child molester and abuser, Jack Scott, I said he just got released from prison. And I said, let's see who the first hireling is to book him for a meeting. You'd have thought I blasphemed the Holy Ghost with the comments that started flooding on my page. My first inclination was to block comments and delete them all. And I thought, no, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to leave them up there so their friends and their family and their church can know how stupid they are to agree with a pedophile preaching in a pulpit. Unbelievable. You say, well, what's your point? My point is, truth's not always embraced. Some people don't want to hear it. Right. Shouldn't stop you from saying it and believing it and living it and demonstrating it. And Gaius loved the truth. And John loved Gaius and was excited about Gaius because of his life and his statement in verse number four, just all in a nutshell, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. The converts, the saints, the Christians that I have invested in and discipled and trained and preached to and taught and sat down with and opened up the Bible and explained the scriptures, it is a blessing to me. There's no greater joy for me, an old preacher, been in the ministry all these years, than to find out that the people that I invested in and preached to are walking in the truth that they was taught. No greater joy. And I'll have to agree with him. I have to agree with him. My wife and I, Get emails from South Africans. <laughs> and we went all the way to South Africa to preach to, witness to, and to find out all these many years later. We got there in 2001, Brother Chuck. Here it is, 2022, and they're still, they're still going. You want to talk about something make you just swell up on the inside. No greater joy than to hear the people that you've preached to and discipled and invested in are still walking in the truth. I'm hoping tonight's message maybe challenges you to do two things. Number one, walk in the truth that you've been taught. And number two, 
find somebody to pour the truth into so you can experience that no greater joy one of these days. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Lord, we thank you tonight for the Word of God, reminding us, Lord, from the Word of God, the importance of the truth, living the truth, hearing the truth, walking in the truth, being fellow helpers of the truth. I pray, Lord, that we would propagate the truth. I pray that you'd help us to find people to invest in, disciple, train, teach, mentor, or to bring along on this Christian journey so we can experience that unbelievable joy of seeing them grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. I pray a specific prayer tonight for the discipleship ministry here at Calvary Baptist Church. Lord, I'm excited about the many pastors. We had a pastor today that called and ordered a whole bunch of those principles of growth. He's gonna start a discipleship ministry at his church. Lord, that thrills my heart. Thrills my heart, Father, to see pastors and churches teaching and training and mentoring their people in the truths of the Word of God. I pray, Father, that we'd walk in the truth. I pray that we'd be like Gaius. The truth would be in us. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be saturated with the truth. We would meditate on it, think about it, live for it, so that our life could be said as one that walks in the truth. I pray that our testimony would be not just before the brethren, not just before the congregation, not just before the saints of God, but that our testimony would be evident, one of faithfulness before the strangers, before the world, or before the lost and the dying around us. May our testimony, Lord, bring people to Christ. May we be that light, that salt that you'd have us to be. May lost people and sinners see us and desire what we have. May we be a blessing and encouragement to the people of God. May we strengthen one another, Father, with our testimony and our love for truth, our love for God. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us, Lord, here at Calvary Baptist Church. Lord, as we grow in grace and knowledge, may we make it a practice. May we make it an objective of ours to find others that we could teach and train. Pour ourselves into, Father. Don't just hog it. Don't just be a reservoir, but may we be a channel that we may be able to see the Word of God go forth. Fellow helpers of the truth, as John said. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, Are you glad you came?